invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to John chapter 15, if you would. John chapter 15. In just a moment, we're going to be reading in verse 18. John chapter 15 and verse 18. Now, what Jesus has been doing in John chapter 15 is he's been giving a, a big vision of the disciples' world, if you will. And Jesus describes it like this. The, the world that you inhabit, disciples, and by extension you and I, is like a vineyard. My father's responsible for everything. He's overseeing this. And in this vineyard, there's a primary vine that's running through it, and that represents Jesus. Uh, from that vine are these individual shoots, these branches, and that represents you. And then the fruit of the Holy Spirit, uh, later on described by Paul as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. That fruit that's coming off is not a direct result of you being fruit-producing people. It's a direct result of you being attached to the vine. And all of this is driven by the third, or excuse me, the fourth word in the, in the English Bible, at least in verse 1. I am the true vine. So our effectiveness and fruit bearing as believers comes as a result of the trueness of Jesus. He is so authentic and effective that being attached to him causes us and forces us to bear fruit. So we sleep at night resting not in the confidence of our own fruit bearing capacity, but rather in him. And as a result, as we've said so many times throughout this, there's no command here to bear fruit. There's a command to abide, to remain in Jesus and in our relationship with him, the effect caused by that abiding is fruit bearing. It's just a natural consequence of, of being attached to Jesus. And then oddly, if you will, look at verse 18. Jesus in this discussion of the fruit and the vine, he says this, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Let's keep reading. If you were of the world, the world would love you as it loved its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So Jesus just suddenly leaves this great metaphor, illustration of the vine and the branch and immediately starts talking about persecution. Why? Well, it seems that Jesus, by giving us this metaphor of the vine of the branch, is painting, if I could use this word because it's important, it's a weird word, but he's painting a, a cosmological vision, like a, a big vision of their life. This is how the world functions. There's no other way to produce fruit than being attached to Jesus the vine. You can either be in, abiding in him or not abiding in him. You can be a believer or a non-believer. And so pursue Jesus, being a Christian, but also pursue fruit abiding. Choose to abide in him. That's reality. There's, there's no other reality but that. There's no place where you can go around the world where that won't be true. That's the reality. That's your world, disciples. That's our world, believers. And then Jesus says, I want to give you another bit of reality. If you do this, if you're all in, you abide in me. You will be persecuted. And the persecution he's talking about here is, is death and torture. And so this morning as we walk through this text, I'm going to use the verbs about them and they. I'm not going to use a lot of we and us because that's not our reality. And significant, providential perhaps, that today we're commissioning the Chinese church here from Emmanuel Baptist Church because China is high on what's called the world watch list. If you want to look at uh, the world watch list, just Google that when you get a moment. It lets you know the top countries around the world where Christians are persecuted. And high on that list is China. In fact, um, seven years ago, I had a chance to go to China and meet with those in what's called the underground church. Just normal believers, casually meeting in a home, but getting there and leaving there in tremendous secrecy because it could cost them tremendously if they were outed for being believers. Since that time, persecution in China has become so severe that the International Mission Board had to, for the safety of the workers there on the field, remove the missionaries. And so we have less intelligence now as to what's really going on in China than ever before, but there is significant persecution. It's only topped perhaps by North Korea where there are uh, according to the watch list, 50 to 70,000 believers in labor camps 
for this reason that they are Christians. So, when Jesus used the word hate and persecution, he's specifically talking about that. Like, significant, life-threatening persecution. And what this passage does, verses 18 all the way down to chapter 16 and verse 4, is it answers two questions. First of all, why is this taking place? And second of all, what is God going to do about it? So to the first question, why are believers going to face this persecution? Why are the disciples going to face this? Well, the first answer of two is found right there in verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. This is another way in which Jesus is the forerunner. He goes before us because the persecution that believers have historically received, and certainly these disciples are going to receive, stems from the fact that Jesus went there first. He was the first of those that would be persecuted for the faith. And so the persecution that they're going to face, again, is going to be significant, real persecution. And Jesus says, it takes place because they hated me first. Now, What kind of persecution are they going to face? Well, Jesus gives a hint um, in chapter 16. Look at chapter 16 and verse 2. We'll come right back to 1527. But look at 16.2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. You immediately think of the Apostle Paul who, being zealous for the Jewish faith... Acts 3 and 4 tells us that he killed Christians, thinking he was doing his right service to God before God um, saved him and changed his name from Saul to Paul, gave him a Christian identity instead of purely a a Jewish identity. This is what they're going to experience. So this is actually what happened. We don't know exactly what happened to all the disciples. We know about some. So a lot of what I'm about to say is a little bit from history, but also from tradition. It may be apocryphal is what they say. We're not exactly sure. But here's the church tradition. So Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthias, all these are all the disciples. They were all killed for the faith. James was the first to die for the faith. King Herod had him killed by the sword. Peter You may know was crucified upside down. John exiled to Patmos. Matthew stabbed to death in Africa. Thomas died by stabbing at the hands of four soldiers. James the son of Alphaeus stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the zealot sawn in half. Paul was beheaded in Rome, possibly at the same time as Peter. And so when Jesus, in verse 8, uses the word if, if the world hates you, he's describing a a future reality. So this is something that is not happening now, but it's going to happen to you later. And the reason why it's happening is because they identify you with me. They hate me, and by extension, they hate you. Jesus already said in Chapter 13, verse 16, that a servant is not greater than his master. He repeats that again. You're the servants, I'm the master. They hate me, so therefore they'll hate you. You're not going to get an out in this. And so look at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, the word world is mentioned there several times, verses 18 and verse 19, and it's not talking about the planet. That's not what it's talking about. Neither is it talking about the, the, the people inside the world. Uh, so John three sixteen for God so loved the world. So it's not the people and it's not the planet. But what he's talking about there in the use of the Greek word cosmos is just very simply the world's way of, of thinking. The world's way of doing things. There is an intellectual infrastructure, framework in the world that's going to cause disciples, people to to hate you. And the hallmark we learned earlier in John of a true believer is love. And so the hallmark of someone that's in the world is hate. Doesn't mean that anyone who's not a believer hates you or is hateful towards you. It simply means that in the world system, it is totally antithetical to the goals of Christianity. The idea of the world is self-assertion. The idea of Christianity is self-denial. And the idea of self-denial is so contrary to the world's way of thinking that it repulses them. So 
So think of it this way. When your body gets some type of foreign substance inside of it, what your body does is it produces antibodies. The antibodies recognize that something is inside your body that doesn't need to be on there. And so the antibodies put up this defense in order to protect the body from, from sickness. And this is the idea, disciples, Jesus saying. The world is thinking that you're the sickness, you're the problem. And so in order to get you out, they're going to produce these antibodies to push you farther to the extreme. And in their cases, they would actually give their life for the faith. I want to stop here and offer a, a word of caution and a word of encouragement. The word of caution is this. We have a tendency to throw around the word persecution a lot, even today in today's culture. But by that, we don't mean what the Christians in China are experiencing or North Korea are experiencing or even what these disciples are experiencing. We simply feel like, because we've experienced it, that someone discriminated against us because we were believers. And maybe you recognized that and it didn't matter or you recognized that and it bothered you or maybe you recognized that and out of that you developed a full-on martyr complex where you think everybody's out to get you. It could be anywhere on that continuum. Um, but this is not because you were fired for being a believer from your job or your family was taken from you or you killed or taken out to a labor camp. It just means that someone slighted you or they wronged you or they did something because they knew you were a believer. And that's very possible today. So I, I caution us from equating what we experience with what the first century believers experienced because it was different, Right? It, it was different. It's just important to note that because if we don't note that, it may make less of the genuine, real, deep physical persecution that they experienced, and it may make us have less sympathies for what's going on in the rest of the world. But with that caution and encouragement, and the encouragement is, if you feel like people look down on you or at least think you're kind of odd or weird because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that means that you're doing it right. You say, what do you mean? Well, just look at verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And it's very interesting that later on in the New Testament, it says this. Listen to 1 John 5, 19. They, or excuse me, listen to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And it's not incidental that the person who wrote that, John, is the same person who's writing this, the Gospel of John. So a believer, if you will, is someone who is here in Arkansas, in America, but that's not our identity. We are not Arkansans, Texans, or Oklahomans. We are not Americans, ultimately. That's your historical, physical reality. Your spiritual, cosmological reality is that you're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And the world will always recognize that, treat it as odd, as strange, and either in some subtle way like we experience in the West or in some profound way like it's happening around the world, will produce antibodies to try to push out what is threatening the world's system and the world's way of living. Jesus is preparing them for that, and at least in smaller ways, we should be prepared to live as people who are never quite understood by the world because we don't belong here. This is not, it's not where we're from. Where are you from? Well, ultimately, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We're going back to our Father who saved us and redeemed us who called us out of this world. This is not where all my identity lies, and so that's where there's not my heart. My love is, 1 John 1 15. You're chosen out of this world. Look down at the passage. Jesus says something interesting there at the end of verse 20. Look at verse 20. He says, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But look at this phrase. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. His point is that, that they didn't. 
Now, the word if there could be conditional, right? But it can also mean, have another meaning, not if. It can also mean since. And this is the way it's meant. Since they didn't keep my word, they didn't keep yours also. So you shouldn't expect that because they, you should expect that because they didn't respond to my teaching, you should expect they won't respond to your teaching. And this is why from the pulpit, um, I, I don't preach to the world. There's a call to the world, but I don't say to the world, shame on you for having a, a wrong view toward life or for living in this immoral lifestyle. Uh, my function as a pastor is not to shame the world, but rather to call them to find Jesus. Jesus can provide all the conviction of sin. My function as a pastor is to call us to have our lives transformed by the word of God. The world acts like the world because they're in the world. That's where their heart, their love, their ambitions are. It's natural. The answer for them is not to reform their behavior, but rather to find a relationship with Jesus. It's like going out of the world and saying, why aren't y'all bearing fruit? Well, uh, <laughs> you have to have them attached to the vine first. The world doesn't hear that teaching. Why? Well, because they didn't hear the teaching of Jesus. Um, but this phrase, if they kept my word, they will also keep yours, shows us that there's this really dividing line between all of human history. There are people who follow God and people who don't. Jesus is putting things in those two categories, if you will. What helps us remember this is our own calendar that's divided between A.D., Anno Domini, and B.C., before Christ. We don't use that language anymore. If you're in the academy, you know we use the language C.E. or B.C.E. in the common era, before common era. But you can change the labels, but you can't change what actually happened. Literally all of human history is divided by the person of Jesus Christ. It just is. And that time is a great metaphor for spiritual reality in that Christ divides everything. People follow him or they don't follow him. If they're following him, there will be people that ultimately will be persecuted. If they're not following him, there'll be people who don't understand Jesus and therefore by extension will be a part of those who persecute Christians and believers. I hesitate to use this illustration because it could be misunderstood, but please don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm trying to say. But when you read about the significant persecution, especially again in the book of Acts, killed for their faith, stoned for their faith, and you think, man, they're just, they hate Christians so much. Why are they doing this? It, it feels like, especially the persecutions we did a few Wednesday nights ago in our study on Acts, it just seems like the people that are hating Christians are are out of their minds. And, and as we get into the spring, we're going to be reading about the crucifixion of Jesus, and we have to be thinking, my word, Jesus did nothing. Pilate recognized it. The thief on the cross recognized this. Why do they hate him so much? They must be, we might think, out of their minds. There's a historical debate uh, a little bit whether Hitler was delusional or not. It makes perfect sense. He did something that was so profoundly evil and he did it apparently with no cognitive dissonance. Like you think, how could someone so... Uh, if they were rational, do something so evil. But the problem is, there's no evidence to that. Meaning, he was organized, he was thoughtful, he was strategic. Um, he was all the things that someone who was out of their mind would not be. So here's a worse thought. Not that Hitler was out of his mind, but rather he was sane. It's a worse thought for us humans to think that one of us, in their right mind, could produce so much evil. He, of course, wasn't directing it toward Christians. He was directing it toward Jews. He was posing as a Christian himself. But the reality is, is that humanity is tragically capable, even in sane minds, of profound evil. And around the world, this is directed toward believers. And the reason why it's directed toward believers is because we are treated the same way that Jesus was treated. If they hate me, they'll hate you. That's why. Jesus gives us another reason in verse 21. They know Jesus and they hate him. That's why. But also they don't know the Father. Look at verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. And Jesus says this again in verse 3 of chapter 16, verse 3. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. 
So Jesus said before, I and the Father are one. And because they don't know me, they don't know the Father. They may claim to know the Father, but they don't know the Father. And because they don't know me, nor they know the Father, the reality is, is that that's going to cause them to persecute you. So that's why. But now let me ask this question. What is God going to do about this? What is God going to do about this? Well, look at verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Here's what God is going to do about this persecution. He told us why it's coming to them, but now what is God going to do about this? Two things. First of all, God sends the Spirit. More specifically, verse 26 tells us that Jesus sends the Spirit from the Father. Now the way he expresses that is important because he's telling us that all the Godhead is involved here. Jesus is sending the Son, but the, or sending the Spirit, but the Spirit is from the Father. So all the Godhead is there. And it's also important the way he says it because look at what he says. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Now, you see the word witness, we think, well, we're supposed to be witnesses for Jesus. And that's true. There are commands to be witnesses for Jesus. Acts 1.8, Matthew 28. But this is not a command to witness. There's no command to go witness here. The point is not that we will be witnesses. The point is that the Spirit will be the witness. Now, <laughs> obviously, the Spirit is a spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a physical body. So he's going to use us to witness. He's going to witness through us. But framing it this way is important because what Jesus is saying is that, look, all of this persecution is not lost on God. There is this great plan to get the gospel to all the world. And when the Father is going to do, when the Son is taking back, he's going to continue on this plan through the work of the Holy Spirit. The plan, Jesus says, is still on. What a remarkable thought. <laughs> all of us in any type of occupation, I guess, and certainly true of those in the ministry who really thought we had it all together two years ago, knew what we we're going to do and what step we had next, really came to realize that we knew nothing once this pandemic hit. It reminded us so clearly of James 4.14. Uh, why do you say I'm going to do this and do this? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then it is gone. Life is so profoundly unpredictable. We don't know what's going to happen next. During this pandemic, I've had things figured out very well about five or six times, um, which means I didn't five or six times, right? But I do know this. Whatever happens next, the Father has still sent us with the Son, the Spirit. That's not going to change. The Spirit will come and execute exactly what He sent the Son to do. Now, what does he come to do? So what is the Spirit exactly going to do? Well, he calls him the helper, remember? And remember back in chapter 14 and verse 16, we're trying to figure out what a helper means. And Jesus said, I'm sending you another helper. And so the helper, the Holy Spirit, does what, the G what Jesus did. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus gave witness to the Father. And so the Spirit gives witness to the Son. What it means that he witnesses is that he'll continue to point people to Jesus, using us to do it. The reason why that's our compulsion, our reality, is because God is still carrying out this great work. So what is God going to do? He sends us the Spirit, but also He sends us the Word. Um, the Word has two functions. One, when the Word comes, it judges the world. Go back to verse 21. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them His Word... They would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Look at verse 24. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and both hated me and my Father. So the function of the Word of God is to give us life. It keeps us abiding in Him. Uh, back up to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. What abiding in Christ is really is allowing the Word of God to, to bear fruit inside of our life. The Word has that function for us as believers. But for those who reject God, this Word that is God's clear revelation of Himself, it 
it condemns them. Because a rejection of God's word allows God to say, I, I gave you my word. I gave you my word. And the rejection of Jesus, the word, John 1.1, 1, 1, and his revealed word that he's given to us here in scripture, special revelation, both of those speak judgment on those who reject it. So look at verse 1, though, of chapter 16. There's another function of the word. One, it judges, but the word that he sends also preserves. This is so encouraging. Chapter 16, verse 1. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Yeah, so why is Jesus saying all these things, right? He's, he's not trying to scare them. He's not trying to motivate them. What Jesus is saying is, these words that I'm speaking to you have the capacity for preservation. If you're listening to what I'm saying, and you'll abide in me, my words abide in you, the persecution will come, and when it does, you're still going to be solid in me. Why? Because I'm strong enough or I have the capacity to withstand it? No. But because his word is in us. So, um, what's going to happen to the believers? They're going to experience this persecution. Why? Well, because the world hates them. And also because they don't know, the world doesn't know the Father. What is God going to do about it? Well, what God's going to do about it is he's going to send us the spirit that's going to keep the mission on, witnessing. And also he's going to give us his word that while it judges the world, it preserves us. Now, before we leave this, there's one question that might still be lingering in your mind. It certainly is in my mind, and that is, why doesn't God just fix it, right? Why doesn't he just eliminate all the persecutors? That's well, a great question. Um, a little bit of the answer is found in verse 11, look at chapter 16, verse 11, concerning judgment, that's why the Holy Spirit is coming, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world, who's that? It's Satan. So this world has a system, a way of thinking that's ungodly, it's anti-God. And that system of thinking has leadership. There's a ruler there, lowercase r. The ruler is, is Satan. So in God's authority structure of all things, he has sublet some space to the enemy as he rules the thoughts of mankind around the world. What an incredible thought. Now, he doesn't rule everything. He doesn't rule the galaxy or the solar system or the galaxies beyond this or all the things we don't know or see. He doesn't rule nature. But in the thoughts and activities of men, Satan has been given some rulership. It's temporary. Look again at verse 11. Concerning judgment because the rule of this world is judged. In other words, he's already condemned. He's just living out his sentence until that final last judgment comes and into Revelation and He's cast down forever and ever. But until that time, he still has some reign, some rule, some authority. And what Jesus is doing is he's preparing his disciples for a life in which this is going to be real. Real persecution. And yet the kingdom of God is going to advance because the spirit comes and he's going to give witness. Both of those things are going to be real and both of those things are not going to change. And so because they're not going to change, what you see in the book of Acts is something very, very interesting. Jesus dies on the cross. He rises again. He ascends back into the Father. But in the first 30 years of the church, documented principally in the book of Acts and a little bit beyond, all the world changes. A scholar by the name of Michael Green wrote a book on the book of Acts, and he entitled it 30 Years That Changed the World. And so what you see is that this tremendous gospel advance that's moving on with the Holy Spirit leading people themselves, with the church exploding in growth, we're leaving a localized place in Jerusalem where it is in Acts 2 and going out all over the world. All of that runs on the tracks of 
persecution. Why that's the case, we'll ask God one day in heaven. But that it's the case, there's no question. We're worried and we pray and we fight all the evil forces that keep people persecuted around the world. And we know also that even though the church is profoundly persecuted, it cannot stop the advance of the church because God promised to send his spirit to give witness. So Michael Green begins his book this way. Listen to this. Three crucial decades in world history. It's all it took. In the years between 8033 and 64, a new movement was born. In those 30 years, it got sufficient growth and credibility to become the largest religion the world has ever seen and to change the lives of hundreds of millions of people. It spread into every corner of the globe, has more than two million adherents. It is an edible, or excuse me, it has an indelible impact on civilization, on culture, on education, on medicine, and freedom, and of course on the lives of countless people worldwide. And the seedbed for all this, the time when it took decisive root, was in these three decades. It all began with a dozen men and a handful of women and with the Spirit coming. So here the church finds itself in deep persecution. But what this ruler, lowercase r, of the world cannot do is stop kingdom advance. And so, can I say, just as a church, we're talking about this big cosmological vision of all the world, what God is also doing, and thinking about the persecution around the world. But just thinking about our little corner of the world here in Little Rock, Arkansas, what that means for us is that we walk in an interesting position in this world. We walk with eyes wide open, because we're not stupid, most of us. Just seeing if you're paying attention there or not. We're not dumb, we're, we're wise as serpents, but we're also harmless as doves. We don't wear our emotions on our sleeves or get defensive about every little thing. We know this. Jesus told us all this is, is coming. And I say, well, pastor, what about this and what about that? And what about, well, I, I don't know. We don't know what's going to come in. We're going to make wise decisions. And in any way we can as a society and our civil governments or influence the way the culture moves and deals with believers, especially the persecuted around the church around the world, we'll do anything we can to alleviate that pressure. But what we do know without any shadow of a doubt is that the kingdom will advance. Why? Because the Son has sent us the Spirit from the Father. And He will continue the work of kingdom advance. So we walk in our little corner of the world with eyes wide open, with a broken, deep sympathy for those that are around the world that are suffering and looking for ways through prayer and financial relief to alleviate that suffering. And yet, at the same time, with a tremendous confidence that what we're doing from this corner and from our city center and from our mission outpost around the world is really going to be effective because it's, it's rooted in the promise of Jesus. That as we witness, what's actually happening is the Spirit of God sent from the Son by the Father is witnessing for us. All the Trinity is concerned with mission advance. So we are too.